Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. If you were here this morning or in session one, we had a wonderful um, turnout for the session on Judaica in the museum and had people from all over the world um, zooming in in the chat saying hello from from Greece and Pakistan and India and England. And so it was really exciting. And as Suzanne was noting, these conversations are not just within sessions, but across sessions. And so it's I, we feel a momentum building already, and that's really wonderful. Luther Obrock is moderating. I'm Melissa Morton, and I'm the project manager for this symposium and for the Hidden Stories Books on the Silk Roads exhibit that is at the Aga Khan Museum closing this week if you are in Toronto. So Sunday's the last day. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Luther Obrock, and I'm a professor of historical studies at the University of Toronto, Mississauga, and at the Department for the Study of Religion at the University of Toronto, St. George. I'm here today to introduce the roundtable on two Poti-style manuscripts from South and Southeast Asia. One 18th century Pancharaksha manuscript from the Kathmandu Valley of Nepal, and one Kamawasa manuscript from 19th century Burma. While we, while we will be focusing on these manuscripts, I think this roundtable seeks to set them in wider webs of connection, seeing them as nodes and networks that connect text and practice across a wide swath of South and Southeast Asia for more than a millennium. I'm particularly interested in the way in which ma the manuscripts chosen here link performance, material, and text. Each of the manuscripts examined here is a prestige object, yet one tied to specific uses within the world. And I look forward to seeing the way in which these manuscripts reach out, as it were, as objects, as art, and as text into the lived world of exchange and ritual and performance. Uh, but before introducing our panelists, I wanted to take my moderator's uh, prerogative to uh, reflect a little bit on these manuscripts uh, and manuscripts in general. Um, uh, that will be the focus of today's discussion. And uh, while you will be seeing many, many interesting images, uh, I thought as a kind of Sanskritist here, I would take this opportunity to tell two stories. So I hope uh, you'll bear with me. Uh, so uh, I want to begin with, with uh, a god and a story. With two brief examples, one from the uh, Mahabharata, tradition, the great Sanskrit epic of South Asia, and one from Bana's seventh century prose poem, the Harshicharita. I will show how manuscript culture interacted with the oral, performative, and lived tradition in ancient South Asia, the area that I know the most about. Um, so in Hinduism, the elephant headed the elephant headed god Ganesha is the remover of obstacles and the lord of beginnings. He is also the patron of scribes and authors. In fact, according to tradition, Ganesha himself acted as the first scribe of the massive Sanskrit epic, the Mahabharata, which we see an uh, image of here on the screen. As the story goes, the Mahabharata's composer, Vyasa, was looking for the best scribe to put his great tale into writing. The elephant-headed god Ganesha agreed on the condition that Vyasa would not stop his recitation and would tell the whole tale from beginning to end. No small matter, given that this is supposed to be 100,000 verses. Vyasa agreed and told the story at such a furious pace that Ganesha's stylist broke. And in order to continue, he broke off one of his own tusks uh, to continue writing, which is why he is also called Ekadanta, the one tusked, as is shown in his iconography even today. Popular images, like the one seen here, show Ganesha writing on a Poti style manuscript, like the ones we'll be looking at later on today. The epic tale of the Mahabharata is recounted by a sage and textualized by a god. In so doing, its continued perform presence and performance in the world is vouchsafed. To begin with, the god in the Mahabharata is evocative and in some ways seems to imitate a shift in the oral transmission to textual tradition. The historical date of these shifts and the technological innovations that accompany them are less well known. The earliest known texts from South Asia, the Vedas, are first textualized, and by that I mean put in written form, millennia after their composition. The Vedas were, and understood themselves to be, oral compositions, passed down from generation to generation, not through writing, but through memory, intended to preserve the phonetic character of the text with an incredible degree of precision. While the first examples of writing in South Asia can be dated to the Ashokan inscriptions in the third century BC, the early man history of manuscripts and manuscript te technology is difficult to reconstruct. 
While early fragments of palm leaf manuscripts have been found, most of these earliest uh, fragments are from Central Asia, preserved by the climate in an area far from the natural habitat of palm trees themselves. A few preserved manuscripts from around the turn of the first millennium survive in Nepal. However, in the rest of South and Southeast Asia, most preserved texts are from the 14th century or later. It's hard to date the appear appearance of palm leaf manuscript technology in South Asia. However, by the seventh century, um, recitation from palm leaf manuscripts was common enough that, it was, that a description of it was included in Bana's great Sanskrit prose poem, the Harshi Charita. The poet Bana describes the reader of ancient stories unpacking his bunch of manuscripts and beginning the recitation after a meal. Uh, and if you'll forgive a long quote, I just think this is so interesting to see how this is all described. Uh, the poet Bana writes, <clears throat> soon the reader, and that is our reader of manuscripts, Sudrishti was observed approaching, wearing a pale, pair of silken poundra cloths, pale as the outer corner of a peacock's eye. His sectarian lines were painted in gold rachana clay from a sacred pool blessed at the end of his bath. His hair was made sleek with oil, a thick bunch of flowers kissing his short, were kissing his short top knot. The glow of his lips had been heightened by several applications of betel, and a brilliance was imparted to his eyes by a stick of collyrium. He had just dined, and his dress was decorous and respectable. He seated himself on a chair not far away, and, after waiting a moment, he set down in front of him a desk made of reed stalks and laid upon it a manuscript from which he removed the tie. And this is how we know it's a, some sort of poti manuscript because they talk about the string that binds it together. Uh, he removed the tie, which still seemed, at, but the manuscript still seemed encircled by the rays of his nails, soft like lotus fibers. Having turned over the intervening leaves marked at the end of the morning chapter, so he had a bookmark somehow in his, in his uh, Poti manuscript, he took a small light block of a few palm leaves and read with a chant the Purana uttered by Vayu, the rays of his teeth seeming to cleanse the ink-stained syllables and to worship the volume with showers of white flowers and his honeyed intonations, like the anklets of Saraswati, that's the goddess of poetry, brought near his mouth, charming the hearts of his listeners. Here, we see the manuscripts are objects of veneration, prestige objects, objects of ritual, and objects of performance. Rather than simply ways of encoding information, manuscripts are deep, deeply embedded in the ritual, social, and sumptuary world of Bana's seventh century present. The manuscripts we're going to look at today also merit such investigations, or perhaps even we can say imaginations. Um, and here we can, I guess we can just show briefly this, uh, the next pictures that show the actual manuscripts that we'll be talking about. Um, uh, here's the 19th century Kamawasa manuscript, and you can see it's careful crafting and uh, beautiful layout. And uh, the Pancharaksha manuscript you can see is also beautifully illustrated in a different sort of way, but with a similar sort of layout. Our speakers today will delve into these manuscripts and their connections in the wider sort of performative world. And let me just introduce everyone briefly, and then I promise I will, I will be quiet and let the interesting discussions of these manuscripts begin. Uh, Dr. Jenna Kim is professor of South and Southeast Asian Art uh, South and Southeast Asian art at Harvard University. Professor Kim's research and teaching interests cover a broad range of topics with a special interest in text image relationships, female representations and patronage, and reappropriation of say, sacred objects. Um, she's been working on a digital humanities project on color and pigments as a way to understand manuscripts better. And I hope she don't won't mind me saying she's a self-professed manuscript maniac and deeply invested in the history of book studies. Uh, Sarah Richardson is a colleague of mine from the University of Toronto, Mississauga, where she is an assistant professor teaching stream in the Department of Historical Studies. Her research on, is on South and South Asian and specifically Tibetan visual and material culture. She's writing a book about mural paintings at the Temple of Shalu in Tibet and showing how the program of murals added uh, to the 15th century temple vis visually explained the rhetoric and organization of the large of large scale book production. Um, to monastic and lay communities. She also works on museum collections, particularly as a consultant on Himalayan objects for the Royal Ontario Museum. 
uh, Trent Walker is the host uh, is the host Center for Buddhist Studies postdoctoral fellow and lecturer in religious studies at Stanford University, where he works on palm leaf and bark paper manuscripts in various Southeast Asian languages like Khmer, Thai, and Tam, uh, or scripts and languages, as well as a variety of pr printed and oral texts in Pali, Cambodian, Siamese, Lana, Lao, and Vietnamese. Uh, at Stanford, his research work draws on uh, nearly 2 million pages of manuscripts uh, that he is curating for the digital, uh, Buddhist Digital Resource Center. Recent published work includes pieces on Khmer inscriptions, Thai literary history, and Vietnamese translation. Um, and uh, uh, lastly, uh, Alexander O'Neill completed his uh, PhD at University of Toronto in the Department for the Study of Religion at the end of 2021, and will be starting a postdoctoral fellowship at the School for Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. His research focuses on Neo Buddhism in the Kathmandu Valley of Nepal. He is interested in South Asian Buddhist literature, in particular Mahayana and Prajnaparamita literature and ritual, in particular manuscript and book worship. So to return to our elephant-headed one-tusk scribe and Bana's performance of the sacred text, I think the stories of Ganesha and Bana remain evocative for how we think about manuscripts and how stories and texts are promulgated. Manuscripts are where performance and material meet, allowing further diffusion and further performance, yet they can also be controlled in sacred occasions. As we look to these particular objects, I hope that perhaps the stories of Ganesha and Bana can be our guides to understand the life of texts in the world. And from that, I will turn it over to uh, Professor Kim. Hello. So, hi, hello, everyone. So, well, thank you, Luther. And uh, I, I love the um, financial story with the, the task of being a scribe. Okay, and thank you, Melissa and Susan, and um, just everyone else for inviting me to participate and just organizing this so beautifully. And I'm so sorry that I've been able, I haven't been able to go see the exhibition, but the the, the three D um, experiential visit to digital uh, virtual visit has been wonderful. So uh, kudos to the Aga Khan team for really putting together a marvelous exhibition and its sort of digital digital component. So. Um, and thank you everyone for joining this conversation today. So I took the charge of today's round table on at least in our section, at least for my part, to be providing more historical, religious and material context for our focus object, at least for, um, my, for my own interest, uh, Nepalese paper manuscript of the Panta Naksha Sutra in Poti format. So I will start by explaining what we mean by Poti format or Poti style manuscripts and where it came from. So there are two types of a palm leaf and two types of practices. So uh, if we, so what you're looking at right now is a sort of 11th century palm leaf manuscript of the Pragyaparamita Sutra that is in the Cambridge University Library. And as you can see, it's just loose folios in like high stack. Uh, and the text actually runs without a break from left to right, and these columns are not uh, meaning columns, that those are actually columns, the holes to hold the folios together. And that actually also means, and if you click on Elisa, there should be a folio that comes up. Uh, so that also means these are all loose folios uh, stacked together. That means you actually have to have pagination. So the, the practice of page pagination developed very early. So the codex books that we're very used to don't need pagination necessarily um, unless you want to reference where you are. So this is sort of by virtue of being loose folios stacked together, you need pagination. And we have to remember it's horizontally long and it's going to be read and flipped top like bottom to top so that's the direction so we have to sort of reorient ourselves from kind of what you're we are used to as a book and I think about a different kind of performance space and sort of dealing with the book okay uh I think next slide has so that there are two types of palm trees that are used for manuscript production in South and Southeast Asia one is a talip of palm corypha umbra crulifera it's its botanical name and these grow wild in Sri Lanka and on the Malabar coast up to 13th latitude. And uh, it used to be cultivated easily up to Konkan, 16th latitude on the western coast and up to lower Bengal on the east coast. So 
it gets really tall and incredibly tall and it's monocarpic. And these, so the, the folio that, I'm sorry, the tree that this person is holding, that's the, the tree that I was actually, I always look for, can I actually see Corypha in in life and uh, the live one. And this was in Pagan actually in Burma that or Myanmar, I was able to sort of track down one tree that actually has been there. So it grows to be about hundred years old. So it's not easily cultivated because it's monocarpic and it grows old to be like hundred years old, but the leaves are so big and you see how that leaf so when we say palm leaf manuscript, it's going to be actually leaflet. So it's cut into that shape. So going to be long and narrow. So Kuti for a manuscript actually comes from that shape that's actually dictated by the material of the palm leaf. And palmyra palm or, um, you know, tal in Bengal, whereas this uh, flavellifer actually is more common palm that's seen everywhere now. And that's going to be actually so much thinner and, 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 and harder. So Teleprot is actually very supple, whereas this uh, Vorasas actually, uh, Palmyra palm is very stiff. And that actually goes to, can you go to the next slide? Two different ways of scribing. So the, the Teleprot palm, you can actually take ink and black ink, so writing as if writing on the paper. Although it's not just the palm uh, leaf, you saw palm leaf is you know, green, this is brown, this has been seasoned and treated and sort of uh, made the supple surface a really easy to write on. Other way that a palm leaf manuscript is uh, written is with stylus as, uh, you know, uh, we, we heard about Ganesha using the stylus to write and actually inscribing on the palm. And that's actually palmyra palm is often that the type of palm that's used for that because it's thicker and also uh, so it takes sort of stylus easier and then you put uh, ink over. So it is almost like an etching in, in a way. It's sort of two different techniques. And that goes to what you're gonna see later uh, in Trent's presentation that you will have this gold leaf that are inscribed as sort of manuscript, uh, kind of emulating the manuscript. So, and this Puti format manuscript, uh, can we go to the next slide? Please is something that I, I think connects South and Southeast Asia together. So I sort of designate this as a palm leaf or puti for manuscript for Cezanne that is sort of dictated by the availability of the, the material itself, the palm trees that actually is sort of part of the, part of the, the drive of that format and how, how it actually is made. And also we have to remember manuscripts are so portable. And I think that's why we actually have a lot of manuscripts and books as part of this exhibition about Silk Road, hidden stories of Silk Road. So that portability actually makes it, uh, they're mo very mobile, very portable. So it's a really easy uh, tool and vehicle of transmission of knowledge. And that's how you actually have these or shared understanding of Houthi format as a book. So it's a sort of uh, different sense of book that is shared across South and South Asia. So from there, can we go to the next slide? So as you know, I, you have seen the exhibition or the virtual one, there are a lot of beautiful books. The art of the book kind of drives the hidden stories of the Silk Road in a way. And uh, a lot of beautiful book, uh, especially in South Asia, we don't really have surviving evidence of making manuscripts with painted uh, panels or a painting in them. The illustrating a manuscript is not necessarily the same sense as you expect that our, we look at like children's book, like, you know, the stories illustrated with these images. That's not how these sort of illustrations will work in this context. So at some point around the turn of the first millennium, the sort of really able and kind of enterprising monks and monastic community, especially with the Buddhist ones, actually start using manuscripts as a vehicle to contain pictorial visual information and start using painted panels added inside the book. Book covers were uh, actually painted earlier, so you have beautiful covers to the book, but then adding the painting into a text was sort of a later practice that developed uh, little late, but we have evidence of this practice at least from the turn of the millennium and first millennium. So this, the painted panels here, what you're looking at, this system of illustrating a book 
and especially the Sanskrit Puthi format manuscript is different from illustrating a text as in, you know, picture books. This is, this really kind of takes care of, think of the book as a three-dimensional object that is, as uh, Luther mentioned, it's to be worshiped, venerated. So what you're looking at is first two pages, middle two pages and last two pages of a manuscript of the a Mahayana scripture, the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra, or Ashtasastra Pragyapamita Sutra, that uh, you know, Alex worked on and works on, as um, Luther explained, as his research. So, and this is a manuscript that was prepared at Nalanda, this famous Buddhist mon monastery in India at the end of the 11th century. So, you just have to have a sense of these painted panels actually working to make a book a very powerful object with painted panels strategically placed inside a space of a book. So a book is almost like a space, a temple. Can we, with this understanding, we go to talk about the tradition of making manuscripts of the Pancharaksha Sutra, which is our focus manuscripts. So Pancharaksha are the five protectresses, five, Pancha five, uh, and Raksha is a like protection. So the female form of protector. So by protector goddesses. This text you can say is an efficient text or uh, an apotropaic text that offers protection to those who commission and worship them. The text is a compilation of the texts of the five goddesses, which actually include goddesses like Mahamayuri and Mahapratisara who appeared in the Buddhist pantheon by the sixth or seventh century when what would be later categorized as esoteric or tantric Buddhism began to appear. These are powerful goddesses that can protect votaries from calamities. Mahamayuri is famous for uh, dealing with snake bites. And if you think about the sort of monsoon climate, snakes are everywhere and snake venoms. Uh, until this day, I, day in South Asia, actually, you know, dealing with snake is a big business. Uh, they, they can be um, scary. So dealing with these fear, the Mahamayuri specialty is deal with snake bites, for instance. Ma Pratisara were, was famous for helping pilgrims and traders on their long distance journey. And they may have developed as sort of, the Mahamayuri and Ma Pratisara, for instance, ha, may have developed as sort of individual goddesses. This set of five goddesses became quite popular along with the rise of the production of painted manuscripts. And the one thing one need to note is that it actually, the text, the, the written text or the recite, recited text is the goddess. So there is an equation that happens between goddess and the text that uh, goes with the Pancharaksha uh, practice. And what you're looking at is uh, this, uh, this is one of the very early manuscripts of the Pancharaksha Sutra. And then I suspect this was probably prepared at Nalanda or nearby. And uh, the iconor iconography of goddess, uh, goddesses follow what is known as a sort of Indian tradition. So there's Nepalese type and Indian type. So there are two different types of iconography that develop to represent these five goddesses. And here they are not yet associated with the five Tathagatas. So what, how you're looking at it is the first panel will have the Buddha preaching, who is actually, the, the text is set as the Buddha preaches this text. And the text is the goddess. So what he's preaching on the facing panel is going to be the goddess that, of the text. So each text is headed by the, the preaching Buddha and the goddess, preaching Buddha and the goddess. So that's how this text is laid out. And, as you can see, they're not yet associated with the five Tathagatas or five transcendental Buddhas that you will hear about from uh, Sarah, actually. In Nepal, though, they quickly became a set of pentad. Uh, so can we go to the next manuscript? This uh, is uh, a dated manuscript actually show the five goddesses and five Tathagatas in the center uh, on the paint pair as a pair at either end of the book. Can we serve, uh, if you click again, there will be the detail of the goddesses. And uh, again, thank you. So those are the five goddesses of uh, sort of Nepalese scheme. You have Ma Pratisara in the center and they're oriented around the, the, the uh, what is it? oriented around the direction. So the white is the center, east, west, uh, blue, uh, red, and yellow, green, north, south, uh, south and north. So that's how the 
spatially they are organized, and this is the set of five that you will uh, find in the Pancharaksha manuscripts. And it is my hypothesis that technological development in manuscript production, especially in Buddhist circles, that is, that is to say, embracing manuscripts as a vehicle for containing images by inserting painted panels in them, actually paved the path to making these five goddesses come together as a set of five. This uh, five texts as go five goddesses serve that unit of, uh, as important unit really goes well with the, the, cult, the rise of the cult of the book, uh, with the especially mobilization of the painted panels in them. So it really made it possible for the book to be the goddess uh, with the images. And it's to be noted that Panch Pancharaksha goddesses are rarely made as independent images to be worshipped separately, but they actually often are worshipped in a book. And that's what Alex Sander will tell, uh, show us, I think. Uh, that's still practiced in Nepal. Can we go to the next uh, page? So with that, we come to this focus manuscript. And this manuscript, I think uh, it has a, it has, it when it came to the collection of the Fisher Library, it seems it came with a note that says it's uh, 220 years old. And that's why the manuscript is identified as sort of a, bearing a date of 1780, I think. Uh, but we have, we were, I mean, Melissa really worked really hard to get us to sort of views of the manuscript. Alexander and I got a view of sort of the backside of it and the rest of the folios uh, from really the kind work of uh, everyone actually opening this case up and showing us what uh, is behind. And so we're puzzled by the date and, you know, we're trying to understand where this manuscript what, when this manuscript might have been made. And uh, there was something interesting about this uh, that I was puzzled by. So I wanted to know what it was. So this is the first page and you have the five uh, Pancharaksha actually represented on the top folio that you're looking at. And we'll come back to that, but I'll show you another manuscript that's similar. Can we go to the next? Uh, so this is a bunch of auction manuscript that's in the Cambridge University Library and uh, the first folio. And this is, um, you know, Ma Pratisara, the first folio, the goddess is represented and you can notice the paper curtain there. So you know that the goddess actually is worshiped inside. And when it's done, you know, they respectfully cover the paint she stacked back. So this looks pretty similar. Can we go to the next? in terms of sort of, you know, the layout, the color pattern, what have you. Stylistically, I don't think they're actually that close, but it is close enough. So if you have a 17th century manuscript, or oh, maybe that is 17th century. But if you, can we go to the next, please? And and if you click it, so this is a folio 38, Mas Sastra Maradani, uh, and that's the first folio. There is definitely affinity, but if you've been noticing the script, the letters next to it. Can we go to the next page? This is a 17th century manuscript. And then bottom is the folio 69 of the Fisher Library Tibetan MS uh, 15 that you kind of see similarities in a way that maybe it's, I think it's slightly later than the 17th century manuscript, but it might come from the same time. So you would think, oh, maybe we were, you know, maybe it is a 17th century manuscript. But if you go to the next slide, this manuscript actually also has pages that are uh, on slightly different type of paper. The yellow paper is when, so once the paper is really embraced as a, the medium to use for manuscript production, they still kind of keep the shape of the palm leaf and they still kind of reference the palm leaf manuscript in a way by making it yellow. By the way, that yellow, that yellowing that happens on these folios are often arsenic. That that would be like orpiment, which also em emulates the color of the palm leaf, but also, uh, you know, it's a really, really uh, powerful insect repellent. So it's actually works both ways. It's like symbolically meaningful, but it's also very practically meaningful. And the script here, the hand is quite different actually from the uh, the the rest of the manuscript. If you Go to the next page, I think, uh, or the click. Yeah, so so you can tell it actually is refurbished uh, folios in, in on a, a little earlier manuscript, actually, probably late 17th century manuscript that 
And because these are practical objects of, of worship that use and venerated and taken out with, you know, there's always candles and butter lamps and what have you. So you can damage these things very easily. And you have, uh, it, there are cases where it gets refurbished and repaired all the time. So you know that uh, this probably was refurbished later. About when we'll talk about that momentarily. Can we go to the next? So this is a late 18th century punter. I mean, again, we don't have the date call up on here, but I suspect this is late 18th century based on the uh, you know, calligraphy and all paleographic features and the painted panels where this is really literally, they're taking the, the, the fact that the goddess, the text is the goddess to the, to the T in a way the, that the color of the text is the color of the goddess. So it really literally, you can see the blue, yellow, green, white, red text. Each text is of the goddess. So the line of the text, the sound of the text is the goddess uh, manifest. And uh, can we go to the next, please? So you sort of compare that, and I will note that the, the, the five figures is not five tatagatas, it's the five uh, goddesses in a way that uh, we are looking at uh, Ma Mantra Sar Anusarini. And can we go to the next? So this is just a comparison I'm uh, giving you in terms of iconography and style that they come close, although I think the pigments and everything else kind of point to the one in, in the Fisher Library manuscript being a little later. Can we go to the next, please? So this is my last slide. So I will end with a reference to uh, another manuscript. This is a Dharani collection that actually includes Mahamantra uh, Nusarani. And this is actually dated. So you actually need sort of dated manuscripts to think about where to put these manuscripts. Uh, if you click that, that uh, uh, Melissa, there is another slide that will come up. Yeah, so here it's, the, that is like a late 18th century manuscript that I think is coming pretty close, but given the, the writing and sort of the paper's quality and everything else, and I'm thinking probably as late 18th, uh, early 19th century, uh, what's actually still puzzling is the painted panel that you're looking at is not of a five, five tagatas. It's, uh, it, you know, this is blue would be Akshobia's color, but the hand gesture is different. So it would be like Vajradhara, it was a different kind of uh, Buddhist, sort of different type of Buddha that's not really introduced in the uh, Pantaraksha sort of iconographic programs usually. So it's a pretty peculiar choice that I'm not quite sure where that comes from. I haven't seen anything else that actually has Vajradhara as the companion to uh, Sasra Paramardani, which is uh, different from any other Pancharaksha manuscripts that I've seen. But so we have a kind of interesting case in the Fisher Library manuscript. And the, again, the manuscript is the goddess. The text is the goddess is again, indicated by this uh, signs of worship that's uh, left with the curtain that's there on that black paper manuscript. So that's about what I have to tell you for now. <laughs> Thank you. And I think my uh, after me is I'll, uh, Sarah. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, hello, can you hear me? <laughs> Um, okay, great. Uh, thank you so much, um, Jenna. That was really interesting. Um, I am, yeah, going in, a, in another direction, um, but uh, it is connected too. <laughs> and I'll show how. So, um, one of the challenges we were also introduced to this morning by um, curator Suzanne Conklin Akbari, she stated at the opening session uh, to think about possible futures for an expanded study of the history of the book, the history of book production, silk and cloth production, and the potential and even the prescient need for what we now choose to see and describe as truly global contacts across an expanded medieval period, if that's even the right word, um, that one that also serves to really disrupt earlier stories, earlier narratives that have been well formed in uh, at least Western consciousness, stories of supposed dark ages, stories of remoteness and isolation. Um, and so everything we're doing today is really seeking to tell different stories around objects. Um, so much is at stake. So 
Um, I want to offer another tangent today of what we can learn through the study of other materials and why the close attention to other art forms and other material forms is another significant way forward in this kind of larger decolonial approach to finding these new stories in the past. So here I am showing as my first slide a bookshelf. So this is a this is a giant uh, bookshelf, and this is a photograph I took myself as a PhD student when I was visiting Shalu in 2009, which sadly is the last time I I have gotten to be there. Um, so uh, I've not been able to be back since, but uh, this shelf holds a giant sacred set of books. One of the earliest copies of the Kanjur that was collected and produced at Shalu. Um, whether this is actually a 14th century set or not, I don't know, as I was not able to take it off of these high shelves and examine the manuscript myself. But um, it's in a room that is directly adjacent to the main objects of my study, this other, these other material forms that I think can help us a lot in telling other situated historical stories about how books work and how they mediated kind of public intellectual consciousness. Um, so books, manuscripts themselves, live long and storied lives. And as Jenna Kim just brilliantly noted for us, books themselves, manuscripts could be like little temples, right? Would illustrated with goddesses in sets. I'm gonna flip that and show how temples could also be books or more properly several well-organized collections of books. And that's what we see here at Shalu. So on the shelves of Shalu, this Tibetan temple with surviving 14th century mural paintings that form the center of my research, lies this early manuscript. This is a fancy set, right? This is uh, gold ink on black paper, an inherently more valuable set because of the nature of these properties, real gold, potentially real indigo, and the inherent material difficulty of making this specific kind of paper. So this is valuable. It is stored as devotional books always are in Tibetan temples at an elevated height with the shelves themselves starting around five feet off the ground and proceeding up to the ceiling. So it'd actually be really hard to reach the top shelf of books if you wanted to, you'd need a ladder. It is in a shrine room on the ground floor of the temple. And this specific temple, Shalu, was a central site for the production of Tibet's early canonical collections, collection projects in the early 14th century. In historical shorthand, while the largely Sanskrit Buddhist texts had trickled at first and then flowed into Tibet from South Asia between, let's say, up to the 10th and 12th centuries, especially by this moment in the early 14th century, a concern had shifted to determining which texts could be deemed authentic and thus integrated into a canon, which would and which should not be. Um, at this temple, under the leadership of a famous scholar, editor, a man who served as abbot from 1320 to 1356, the Lama named Bhutan Rinchen Drup. Um, early manuscript editions of both the Kanjur, which is seen here, the this Kanjur means the words of the Buddha, i.e. meaning the teachings that he himself taught from his own uh, teachings. And, and also in another room upstairs, the copies of the tan Tanjur, the treatises or commentaries on those words, which is also a large set, were made at Shalu in the 1330s. To do this work, we can, we're invited here to think of this work as a social project where a few hundred literate monks, who Bhutan affectionately called in his letters, his Kalyanamitras, his virtuous friends, specifically in a Buddhist context, were hosted at the site in the process of this renovation. So um, next set, next slide, please. Okay, so the sacred set and the power of five. <laughs> um, what is a canon? What is an editor? Who do they work for and why? What were Tibetan teachers like Bhutan, for example, interested in and working tirelessly for many years to create canons of texts deemed authentic. Further, as that thinking was expanded across other material venues, I will argue across murals as well, what can we learn? So here, one of the things that I wanna say in broad strokes is that organization was key. And we see this kind of interest in, in Buddhist arts in these numerical sets, like for example, the set of, we're talking about a set of five goddesses that 
later got connected to this set of five Jinna Buddhas or five Tathagata Buddhas. Um, these are um, these are the five Buddhas I've, I've shown illustrated here um, on the left. This is a, of course, obviously very modern, I think Adobe drawing of uh, made by my teacher and mentor, Professor John Huntington, who taught at Ohio State University and who just passed away a few months ago, but from whom I learned a lot. And here he makes a just very clear di diagrammatic representation of these five Buddhas who Jinnah has already alluded to for us. Um, but these five Buddhas so often form the basis of the the five part mandala seen here on the right in a painting housed at the ROM um, that is not part of this exhibit, but is here in a Toronto collection. While it is hard to go into much detail, and some of you may already be familiar with mandalas and sacred geometry, I just wanted to say that to properly understand the view being provided in a diagram like the mandala at the right, it might it kind of helps to imagine that you're looking down from a bird's eye view on a kind of doll's house with four walls where each of the walls has si simultaneously fallen over in each direction. Um, so you're seeing and where, where you see four quadrants, they're blue at the bottom, yellow to the left, red on the top and green on the side. And those four serve to orient the viewer also to the center, right? It's five directions, which are start with east and proceed around um, the around the directions. So east, south, west, north. Oh, I get that wrong sometimes. Anyway, um, but then also orient you to the center. And those Buddhas at the left are shown in that modern diagram that John Huntington made of um, according to differentiated in their kind of basic iconography in the color of their bodies and the mudras that they perform. So the, the gestures of their hands. And I also wanna bring your attention to the fact that, so the first Buddha that you would start with and the way you would enter the mandala, which is the, the bottom section, the blue section with Akshobhya. And Akshobhya is also putting his hand down into Bhumi Sparsha mudra, the earth touching gesture. Um, so this is the gesture that recalls the moment of the Buddha's enlightenment, like the moment he reaches down and calls the earth goddess to witness his enlightenment. Um, and so is, so we can also see the progress through the five Buddhas as a kind of biographical progress through the Buddha's life as well. So we can see Akshobhya and Bhumi Sparsha Mudra, earth touching gesture, Ratnasambhava then turning the hand out like a gift giving gesture, Bharata. Um, Amitabha, who would be in the Western quadrant and has a whole separate, very important, um, you know, practice around him, especially in East Asia, but here is one of the five, um, it, unseparated from them, and he's in Dhyana Mudra, a meditation gesture, um, Amoga City in Abhaya Mudra, which is a have no fear gesture, and then the central Buddha, who here is, of course, very small in this painting, and this painting is not very big, actually, so it's, it's in really fine detail, um, but Vairochana Mudra, who is shown in a Dharma Chakra Mudra, which is, means turning the wheel of the Dharma, it's a teaching gesture, and there are many different um, versions thereof. So this geometry describes, is often used to describe space and to describe temporal processes, right, toward, of, the, of the Buddha's own life, and then also hopefully applied to uh, other others in, in their practices. Um, next slide. So nothing happens by coincidence or accident. This is uh, one of the five Jinnah Buddhas. And I hope actually some of you who are paying attention will note my mistake here in the name on the slide. Um, <laughs> the, I forgot to change the name. Is it Amoga City? Amoga City should be green, right? And this is clearly not. <laughs> this is in fact, should say, Ratnasambhava. This is yellow. Um, but believe me, Amoga City's there too. I just changed the picture at the end. Um, but this is one of the five Buddhas. All five of them are painted on the wall directly adjacent to that bookshelf that I was just showing you. Um, so they're, monu they're painted monumentally over life scale right beside those sacred conjure books that I just showed you. And they've been there. They were painted there in the early 14th century. They were painted to interact with the books on the shelves in that room, right? They were, they, those are the two, you know, the, the two walls where the bookshelves are were never painted behind them. So murals were only added to two walls of the room, whereas the other two walls hold decorative book collections. Um, 
you can see also that uh, even though I'm just showing you one here, the treatment of the body is extremely beautiful, right? Extremely beautiful shading uh, on the on the body. Um, and this is clearly done by a master's hand in the Newar art painting tradition that would become a favorite in the Mongol courts of China. This is the Yuan court as well around this exact time. So Newar artists, like we're seeing in that later manuscript at this earlier time, were definitely already on the move, taking their brushes and knowledge of textile patterns and bodies with them, available for hire and highly desired. Um, next slide. So as I've mentioned, the temple itself uh, was completely overhauled and renovated in the early 14th century under the tenure of the famous abbot Bhutan, who through Shalu's close alliance with the house of Sakya was the beneficiary, beneficiary of direct Mongol patronage at this time. So what, the, what this means is money and craftsmen to renovate. So on smaller 11th century foundations that had already been there at the site um indeed built right over top of them and i sometimes describe this to my students like it's a it's only a renovation in the sense that a giant spaceship descended on top of a shack and the the new temple is just enormous compared to what was there before um right over top is this new temple and on the right you're seeing a photograph uh, again from 2009 where you can see those green glazed tiled roofs of Shalu still uh, up above the traditional flat roofed architecture of a Tibetan town um, and on the left you're seeing a, a computer drawing obviously of the of the architecture of the temple in the 14th century renovation which we might as well just call a giant new temple um, so it's, there's a lot going on in this new temple that I don't have time for today, but one thing I want to bring your attention to is that also later texts and later pilgrim accounts of, of Shalu often refer to this temple as the one with a special roof of bright green gathered turquoise, which should alert us all to the, also to the material specialness of that roof, right, of, the, of this beautiful, amazing roof. And it's a Chinese style glazed tile roof that would have been very hard to make in Tibet at the time. But um, I digress. So what, ha what happened was when they renovated Shalu, they add four uh, cardinal direction shrines. Now again, order, organization, cardinal directions, and orienting one to a center are operating at an architectural level as well. Next slide, please. What happens in the interior of the temple is that a giant uh, passageway, it's called a korlam, uh, a circumambulatory passage. Basically, korlam just means like circular path, circle path. And there are all sorts of korlams in all sorts of other uh, Tibetan venues. But this one is a bit special and different in that it's very large, long, enclosed and tall. It would have been dark, but there's a few windows that punctuate it, so you can see. And what I'm showing you here, so on the left is a, just a diagrammatic drawing of where the korlam is in the temple. You can see that it was really built to encircle the whole, like the whole of the first floor, the whole of the ground floor of the shrine. That's a, the, the square in front of it, by the way, is a courtyard. It's an empty enclosed courtyard for, for gatherings and festival times and stuff. But that's really a, a passageway that encloses the whole first floor. And then what do they add to that section? Well, they add a whole book, a whole book. And I think, so my, my argument here for us is that by paying close attention to what books get added to walls and how, and why, we can sort of think about kind of the mural as the public facing art program, the, the, the Twitter or the <laughs> Facebook of the 14th century. Um, so what book is added? We're, I'm looking here, that it's a terrible photograph, but kind of on purpose because the whole passageway is quite difficult to photograph. But what is painted there is 100 stories they're stories of the of the Jatakas um, and Jatakas mean uh, some of you probably know of them, but they're the previous life stories of the Buddha before he was the Buddha before he as, as a Bodhisattva across many lifetimes. So he's born as a merchant and a dancer and a tiger and a, all sorts of things right. Um, so uh, 
this that's that's what we're seeing here. What I want to also bring your attention to is that the book is both inscribed. So you see those big white uh, panels. Those are the Tibetan inscriptions. Each each story reduced to one single page, quite carefully redacted, actually, because the longer textual version that we can still consult of this set of texts. Often some of the some of the Jataka stories are really long and some of them are short. They're 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 not all the same length, but some of them had to be really, really redacted for the wall space. Um, but they're they're not only shown as as inscriptions. They're shown as paintings as well, and they're in two tiers. I'm showing you that uh, again. Interestingly, just like the books stored in the in the um, in the room that I was showing earlier, the uh, shrine room. Here the paintings start at five feet and proceed all the way up to the roof line. So again, mostly above your head. And believe me, if you take time trying to photograph these, you feel it because it, you crane your neck a lot. And it would have always been so, right? You can only, the passage is only so wide, you can't get that far back. So it's two tiers and they are in sets of 10 and there's a hundred stories. And this is a very specific book. This is this, this specific collection of Jataka stories that's brought together by another Tibetan teacher at this time, uh, the third Karmapa, Ranjung Dorje. Um, and there's a whole lot we could go into there, but I won't for now. So what I argue here is that um, the design of this whole passageway is really meant to create a cinematic experience of one book to give everyone who visits and remember the ground floor of a temple is a sp specifically rich area for pilgrims both monks and and lay people to visit regularly and we must also remember that a lot of people in the 14th century everywhere aren't reading books right so a few literate people are very involved in producing and reading books but a whole bunch of people aren't, but the rest of the people who aren't are the ones who have to basically pay foot the bills for everyone who's involved in the production of books. Um, so the art project here um, shows us that uh, by painting this whole book across the passageway, um, there's really an argument for uh, how books actually function and why they matter. I'm showing you just one detail here. This is um, story 90 out of 100 so we could go we, we could have fun um and it shows you though just how much detail each narrative is also painted with um there on the left in this story um this is the story of sonam top the prince whose name means the power of merit and he's one of five brothers and he's feeding hungry ghosts with his blood and then in the in the dramatic apex of this story which is at the right he's reconstituting a a, a prisoner whose limbs have been cut off so you see the guy down on the lower right side who's had his arms and legs cut off um the bodhisattva sonam top goes up to him and gives him his uh his arms and legs um so looking at art and even specifically these datable mural paintings those that survive in sacred temples and shrines closely associated with book projects could present new and rich avenues for understanding what was at stake in the creations and organizations of knowledge especially around book projects at specific historical junctures studied in this way we get a more complete picture of the forms of intellectual and social labor labor that were going on in these projects and the many people involved across many scales this is not the labor of a few men or even a few elite families, but rather of a society as a whole. Murals, this public art venue, this medieval billboard, are called to action to explain, especially to those who can't read them, how and why books matter. In inscriptions shaped across a hallway like so many fully revealed pages of a book, viewed in cinemascope with the pilgrim viewer walking past the moving pictures, the paintings make arguments through what is selected for display and how it's represented, which is richness and color and detail, on which stories matter most, and even, I think in a larger sense, why viewers should care about books at all. What the Shalu canonical collection, canonical editions, and the 14th century renovation of this temple, which included architectural innovation, mass amounts of mural painting, and I've only shown you like details of two rooms when there's like three uh, multi roomed levels of the temple fully painted in this time, not to mention a bunch of sculpture, which we've lost, required so many processes, financial supports, intellectual interests, 
and people, right? We have those Newar artists at the site, uh, scribes and editors, copyists and illuminators, engineers and technicians for managing new technologies like the addition of a Chinese style glazed roof. Um, and painters, oh, the painters. I imagine, I, I know of at least from my research, at least two groups of painters, one of clearly Newar painters from the Kathmandu Valley, already famous and desirable artisans in Tibet and across Asia at this time, and Tibetan painters working with an expanded visual language that's been expanded by exposure to illustrated book manuscripts moving from Central Asia into Tibet. The paintings then show us diverse peoples, even some of our earliest Tibetan portraits of human women who are neither goddesses nor patrons, and a category that Jatakas both enables and demands. So um, that's that's what I've got to say. Uh, even though it's a departure from our Newar manuscript itself, I think there's a lot, uh, the, the argument here is that there's a lot to be gained by looking at the way books are expanded into site-specific temple sites. Okay. Um, all right, thank you, that's it. Yeah, so, uh... Uh, th thanks so much, Sarah. That was really fascinating. Um, so yeah, a lot of what uh, you know I work on and what Jenna works on works on they overlap a lot. So you know Jenna talked a lot about the material side of the Pancharaksha manuscript, and I can talk a little bit more now about um, how the manuscripts might be used in a ritual context. So uh, just as an example, I have some footage I took. Um, uh, uh, about three years ago. Um, it's quite short, so let, let's see if it will play, and then I can talk about it after. Ah, there you go. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> so there's quite a lot of things. Uh, yeah, there, there are quite a lot of things in that uh, very short video that, that I could uh, speak about. Uh, maybe just a few words of introduction about this uh, kind of recitation practice. So as you could see, um, uh, the recitation involves the division of a manuscript between uh, five different tantric priests. Um, and the term for this kind of priest in, um, in Sanskrit uh, is Vajracharya, which essentially means, um, uh, well, it means a diamond uh, priest or a diamond teacher. Um, but essentially, these are the ritual specialists for uh, Buddhists in the Kathmandu Valley. And the ethnic community which they belong to um, is called Newar. And, and you may have heard uh, this term uh, used earlier in, in the presentation. And essentially, uh, Newar is related to the name of the country, Nepal. Um, and essentially, it's the ethnic group which makes up the um, indigenous inhabitants of the Kathmandu Valley. Um, so uh, this particular recitation is done uh, is performed by an association of tantric priests, and the name uh, is at the bottom of this uh, slide there. It says Vajra Acharya Puja Bidi Adhyayan Samiti. And so there are lots of groups which do these kinds of recitations, but usually it's organized by a temple. Um, this particular association uh, can organize recitations um, at somebody's home or in a variety of uh, temples which the priests who are members of that association might be associated with. Um, but the recitation uh, and the worship of these manuscripts, as I will talk about them, um, really differs from each temple uh, to each temple. So how, essentially how I, how I uh, got to know uh, the worship of these manuscripts um, is how the Vajracharya Puja Bidya Dhyayan Samiti uh, has worshipped them. Uh, so if you were to go to, you know, the next uh, temple over in the same town, uh, Lalatpur in uh, the Kathmandu Valley, uh, you would, um, yeah, you would see a, you, you would see a slightly different uh, worship. Uh, and if you were to go across the Bagmati River to uh, Kathmandu city proper, 
uh, then you would see a very different kind of worship. So each, each kind of worship differs um, in each uh, city. Um, now the manuscripts are divided evenly. Now, as you could see, there were five priests. And as you know, as you know by now, there are five goddesses um, who are um, in this sutra, in this text. Um, however, the text is not divided uh, usually from what I from what I observed, it's usually not divided by chapter or by section. It's usually divided evenly, so each priest can finish at roughly the same time. Again, the practice differs from temple to temple, but um, at this in this particular temple, um, they just divide it evenly. And uh, the idea is, um, as uh, as Jenna mentioned, uh, the goddess is essentially. Um, is essentially identified with the text, with the sutra. Um, she, the goddesses are also identified with mantras or dharanis, also called uh, vidya, uh, in these texts. And the recitation of those is claimed within the text uh, to have ritual efficacy. But the primary way in which the five, uh, the pancharaksha, uh, or the primary way in which the five goddesses are invoked is appears to be through the recitation of the sutra, as you can see here. Um, so um, yeah, uh, let's move on to the next slide. Uh, so the, the, um, the footage that you just saw is from a temple, as, as I mentioned, it's in Lalitpur, which is in the Kathmandu Valley. And uh, it's at a temple called Kwa Baha, which literally means uh, hot monastery because there's a, apparently a hot spring underneath uh, the monastery, uh, but the Sanskrit name Hiranya Varna Mahavihara uh, is, uh, tra translates uh, roughly to the Golden Temple, which it's well known, uh, well known as in English. Um, now, uh, this was founded uh, around the beginning of the 15th century by Newar Vajracharyas. Once again, Vajracharyas are these ritual specialists who um, are relied upon by Newar Buddhists uh, in the Kathmandu Valley. Um, and uh, this picture here is just, a, just an example of what you'd see if you were to approach uh, the temple uh, shortly before it opens in the morning, um, uh, the doors uh, closed with an image of a Bhairava or a, um, a fierce protective deity. And uh, let's let's go into the temple now. Uh, so let's uh, have a look at the next slide. So this is what you would see um, if you were to go through those doors. Uh, essentially, the the layout of Newar monasteries is very similar to the kinds of uh, Tibetan monasteries uh, that uh, that Sarah um, was was you know showing pictures of. Um, and you can also uh, very quickly see why the temple got the name. Uh, golden Temple. Um, so, uh, Newar monasteries are usually laid out um, with about three stories and generally exoteric rites. That means rites which uh, any layperson can sponsor um, without any esoteric or secret initiation um, can be done on the first or second floor. But tantric rites, which are esoteric, they're they are secret, they need initiation and can only be done by Vajracharyas or ritual specialists. Those are usually done on the third story and they're not accessible to the public. So in the past, if you, if you were to see a picture from about 50 years ago of this courtyard, you would have seen the kinds of recitation that I just showed footage of. You would have seen that kind of recitation formed uh, in this courtyard on the floor. Um, in fact, right on the floor where uh, uh, where you can, um, which you can see in this picture. Uh, these days, however, uh, probably because of more uh, tourist foot traffic at the Golden Temple, it, it seems that they're that they are usually done in rooms to the right and left of this courtyard. Um, so yeah, so th that that's how the recitation was done in the footage that you saw earlier. Uh, so let's uh, move to the next slide. So here is an image uh, prior to the division of the manuscript folios. And as you can see, it has been worshiped with uh, various goods uh, beforehand. Uh, so you can see uh, some bills of money uh, placed on top. Uh, you can see a sacred thread 
placed around it. Um, you can see uh, a flower garland, and you can also see uh, eight prestations of uh, beaten rice with fruit on top. And these, oh, sorry, um, yeah, that's right, eight. <laughs> so these all have different purposes, and um, I could go into maybe, uh, you know, 20 or 30 different things which are done uh, prior to opening uh, the manuscript, but just, just to outline some of the things which you see here, uh, underneath the manuscript, you might see a little bit of rice. So, pro so on the, uh, wherever the manuscript is usually placed, uh, there are usually uh, three circles of rice put underneath the manuscript. And this, at least, um, you know, at least as performed by this, um, this uh, committee, the Vajracharya Puja Bidya Dhyayan Samiti, differs from every monastery. So this is just an example of how a Pancharaksha manuscript could be worshipped, um, not necessarily universally the case. But in this case, uh, th those three circles of rice, which are underneath the manuscript, represent uh, the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. And the Buddha is, um, is uh, divided and worshipped uh, into um, into nine Buddhas, so um, uh, and and the same with the Sangha and the same with the Dharma. So with the, with regard to the Dharma and this kind of uh, this kind of um, so Dharma is uh, by the way for those who may not be familiar that's the word for the teachings of the Buddha. So uh, uh, the the circle of rice which represents the Dharma would be divided into nine uh, sections um, representing uh, nine sutras nine uh, discourses of the Buddha. And so uh, we kind of see a little bit of a connection to what Sarah was talking about with regard to canonization. So um, so at one point, in fact, the Pancharaksha was, was part of that canon of nine sutras, which made up the Dharma Mandala, along with another text called Nama Sankiti. Um, so, and these are two shorter texts, which are usually used for recitation. Um, but uh, these days, they are they are no longer part of that uh, that canon. Um, usually, so they they've been replaced by longer uh, longer Mahayana sutras. Uh, but it's interesting that before every worship of any sutra, regardless of what it is, uh, each of those nine uh, texts are worshipped in the form of the Dharma Mandala. Um, so the the center of that mandala, which is you know important in Newar Buddhism, um, which uh, which was mentioned earlier is something called a prajna paramita, uh, which in Nepal is usually pronounced pragya paramita or perfection of wisdom in English. And perfection of wisdom is a, similar to pancharaksha. It's both a text and a goddess. Um, so it's possible that in the past, a lot of the purposes that the perfection of wisdom manuscript uh, is being recited for today would have been um, would have been the purposes for which the uh, the Pancharaksha was recited for, but it seems that in recent years the perfection of wisdom has uh, become the primary uh, the primary sutra that has been recited uh, for um, apotropaic purposes for things like um, uh, uh, recovery from uh, from illness. Uh, safe travel uh, and those sorts of things. So, um, Pancha, uh, Pancharaksha, of course, is is still recited, um, but um, its popularity uh, in comparison to uh, Pragya Paramita is um, is going down. Um, so, um, maybe just one other example of what is what is done, um, what is done in in worshiping the, these manuscripts. Um, in order to open the text, you have to invite lots of different gods and goddesses to witness uh, the recitation. Uh, so one of one of them were, were those eight prestations of rice, and those represent uh, eight goddesses called Ashtalasya, Ashtalasya, and um, and so these kinds of deities are invited to witness the recitation and to ensure that it goes safely, and the sponsor uh, will. Uh, essentially write the intention. Usually they would write the intention for the practice on a piece of paper and give that to the officiating priest, who is, uh, as you can see, he's the, he's the man on the left in this picture here with the glasses. 
So before the recitation, he would read the names of the people who would be recipients of the merit of the recitation and the purpose for which it's recited. And if there's no purpose um, specified, it would just be for general uh, merit, which you might conceive of as being like a good luck or good fortune. Um, so yes, as you can see in this picture, after the manuscript has been, has been worshipped thoroughly, uh, and as you can see on the left, uh, there's quite a lot of things which have been you know, heaped upon the manuscript. It's uh, divided uh, into even parts um, and recited. And then when it's finished, uh, the, the folios will be put back together and the uh, sponsor will, uh, will, give pre uh, will give a stipends to the priests, will give donations to the priests. And in turn, usually the, um, the sponsor will receive uh, Will, will themselves receive uh, in turn um, uh, blessings from the priests and tika. So that kind of red and yellow paste, which you saw on the actual manuscript folios uh, is placed on the, uh, on the head of each participant, including the sponsor. And they would also receive uh, usually a garland. And in the case of the Pancharaksha, uh, I, I usually saw that people would, would also receive um, a thread uh, blessed uh, with the um, Pancharaksha, uh, blessed by the Pancharaksha uh, deities of, of five colors. In other cases, that, that color would be associated with the five Buddhas. But uh, in uh, this case, it, uh, the Vajracharya said it was associated with the five uh, goddesses. Um, so, yeah, so. Um, Let's see what else could be said um, in terms of the uh, in terms of the worship and the and the efficacy of the worship. Uh, as as Gina mentioned, um, on the one hand, uh, the texts themselves promise benefits for reciting certain mantras, uh, but reciting the act, but having the text actually recited um, is uh, appears to be conceived of as the primary way to, um, to uh, allow the goddesses to act uh, in the world. And the, the sutra itself, the text itself is associated with the goddesses. And this is very interesting when we think in terms of agency. So who is it that does acting and what is it that does acting? So for humans, we think in terms of intention and, um, and performing an action. In terms of these uh, of these texts, um, it you know we can think in terms of um, what kinds of benefits are being attributed uh, to these texts um, after they be after they have been recited, uh, and so so that's in terms of you know participants attribution. But in terms of ritual attribution, prior to using these manuscripts, they undergo um, they undergo a rite called jiva nyasa which means placement of life. So they are actually empowered with a life um, within the manuscript. So they are, they are believed to actually be alive. Now, if they have, okay, I can go into the details of which life is actually in the manuscript, but you know, if you ask uh, the average uh, person, they would say, yeah, Pancharaksha has uh, the uh, Pancharaksha goddesses in it, the Pragyaparamita has Pragyaparamita goddess in it. If you had to ask a Vajracharya, they would say, well, it's all uh, Pancha Buddha, it's all the five Buddhas. Um, but yeah, I, I think um, you know, these kinds of reflections uh, can be useful in, in trying to understand not only how uh, texts are worshipped, but, but why they are worshipped and how they are conceived of, uh, conceived of as having agency. Um, so in Nepal, the agency of the text as it's claimed within the, within the uh, manuscripts uh, is certainly taken seriously. And as an anthropologist, uh, I also have to take uh, the claims of the texts themselves uh, seriously in trying to trace where is the agency here in terms of uh, ritual performance. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Alexander. Thank you so much, Jenna and, and Sarah, for these really uh, engaging presentations through the ways, say, that, that Jenna illuminated how illuminated manuscripts 
and in this poti format become temples uh, of in and of themselves through the way Sarah showed in the broader function of uh, Buddhist stories, uh, including uh, this particular example at, at Shalu, as the book itself uh, is placed onto the temple, the temple in that case becoming a book. And then just, just now through Alexander and the way that you showed in such detail the steps of uh, worshiping uh, the particular kind of manuscript uh, that we are, are looking at, this Bancharaksha uh, uh, manuscript. And really, I was struck in thinking about all of your presentations, the way you, for us listening, have brought uh, this manuscript to life, have performed this kind of jivanyasa action of through reciting and bringing uh, forth the context have uh, brought this, this text and the uh, imaginations of its agency for us. So I'd like to switch gears now to talk about the other object uh, that's been selected for this uh, presentation. And hopefully we'll see some parallels, but also many differences in terms of how this particular Bodhi style manuscript was created it might be used and how it embodies certain key features of the Theravada Buddhist ritual tradition. So on this first slide here, you see a few of the leaves of this particular uh, Bodhi style manuscript. It's given here the title Gamawaja in, in Pali and in the Burmese pronunciation of the Pali Gamawasa. Uh, because the text within it is a Gamawaja text. Uh, in Sanskrit, this would be Garmavajana, words of acts or words of action. And the particular acts that are being referred to here are acts of the Sangha, as uh, Alexander referred to in his presentation, the Buddhist monastic community in this context. So many Gamawaja texts are associated with particular key moments in the lives of Buddhist monastics. And the most prominent text selected for Gamawaja manuscripts is that of ordination. And the ordination of a monk or a nun in the Theravada Buddhist tradition follows a particular script. And that script is laid out in the Gamawaja texts. If we can move to the next slide, uh, we can see here at the particular ordination ceremony taking place in a, in a neighboring country for which this manuscript is from here in Bangkok and Thailand at Wat Arun, uh, we see a monk on the left who is actually preparing to receive full ordination as a bhikkhu, or a fully ordained monk. And then his preceptor on the right is preparing him to go through with the rite of ordination. And they, in this moment, are following a, a script, the script drawn from these Gamawaja texts. And in this case, as in almost every Theravada ordination ceremony, no manuscript is actually used because both parties are expected to memorize all parts of the script prior to the ritual taking place. Someone else, perhaps another monk, uh, may be holding the text just to make sure that the ritual is proceeding properly. But by and large, the text is entirely memorized. The parts that are to be recited uh, by the, the postulant, here to become a monk, the ordinant, as well as the person ordaining him, uh, are each uh, recited in turn. And the script follows a series of questions and answers uh, where the preceptor may say, this is your bowl. Like behind uh, the monk, we can see uh, the bowl on his back sticking out a little bit. This is your upper robe. This is your lower robe. And in each of these statements, the monk who is being ordained is expected to reply, yes, venerable sir, yes, venerable sir. 
And another part, the monk is asked, Kim uh, si, what is your name? And uh, the monk is expected to reply, Aham Bhante Nagonama, my name is so and so. At another point, the preceptor will ask, uh, Do you have such and such an illness? And there are many different kinds of illnesses that make one ineligible to be ordained as a Buddhist monk or a nun. In this case, the person being ordained will respond no. So this is the content of the text uh, that is represented by this particular Burmese example in the collection. If we could move to the next slide, please. The format of this particular manuscript is in a set of discrete leaves, this bulky format that we see used all across South and Southeast Asia, but the materiality of this particular manuscript is quite distinct. So it's not made of palm leaf, it's not even made of paper, another very important manuscript format in the region, but is made from silk that has been successively lacquered, making the silk increasingly stiff and suitable for writing. And then at either end of the manuscript, uh, wooden boards have been cut to match the exact size of each of these silk and lacquered leaves of the manuscript. If we could move to the next slide, please. Here, this is uh, one of the, the covers that's been intricately uh, decorated in the process of making the manuscript. And if we move to the next slide, we can see that within the manuscript itself, the text is brought out in black. But like many manuscripts of different formats in Southeast Asia in particular, the text and its color is reversed in a certain, in a certain way. So if we recall back to Jinnah's presentation, the Talipot palm, which is the particular palm uh, that's more pliant and can be incised and inscribed and is the one that grows throughout uh, Southeast Asia and also more southern latitudes in India. When a manuscript is inscribed, the scribe will take the, the stylus, usually a sharpened piece of metal, and carve into the manuscript. Those letters are initially invisible. It's only after uh, then taking ink that's been usually made of lamp black or soot that's uh, onto a cloth and wiping the whole manuscript. So a whole uh, leaf turns black, allowing all of the ink to settle into the incised grooves. And then we have a totally black manuscript. After that, when it's wiped clean again, the ink only remains in the inscribed portions. We see a similar process uh, taking place here. So once the silk is lacquered, and, and polished, it becomes a very shiny black. And that's actually this underlying black we see in the letters. The manuscript is in the Pali language, and the, this is a particular variant of the Burmese script known as Tamarin Seed Script, or this square script, uh, because it's a very stylized form of Burmese script, really only used in this particular kind of document, these Kamalaja manuscripts. Once the whole uh, lacquered leaf is polished in black, the scribe takes this orpiment to this kind of yellow arsenic, sulfur arsenic pigment, again, what we heard to, we heard uh, Jenna referred to in her presentation, and uh, marks out all of the letters that will be uh, written on, on each page. So it's initially black background with yellow letters. Then, a gold uh, leaf is applied across the entire face of each leaf of the manuscript. And it's only once that gold leaf is rubbed away that it remains on the portions that just had the lacquer, but falls away from the portions that have been pigmented. So that's why we have this gold leaf filling the background and then the underlying portion of the letters coming to the surface. Then the last stage is decorating in red lacquer. Those are all the additional uh, designs we see in red. If we could move not to the next page yet. Yes, the next page is perfect, thank you. Uh, this is zooming in to just the, the letters on, on this, so the inner part of what we were just looking at. 
and you can see the, the gloss and shine that's maintained through the lacquer, the way the, the gold leaf stands out from it, and also the, the very stylized form of this script. So the very first line starting from the top uh, left on the, the top line, this particular script is read top to bottom, I'm sorry, it's read left to right, then each line top uh, to bottom begins namo tasa bhavato arhato samasambuddhasa, the opening invocation of homage to the Buddha that's very common in Pali manuscripts before, before going on to the opening lines of the Gamawaja text for ordination. And the letters are extremely stylized such that many letters, for instance, in the word uh, Bhagavato, the first, uh, the third word we see here, each of those letters just looks like a square, but very subtle differences are being crafted by the scribe to make this distinction between the sound B, uh, G, and V. Then if we move on to the next, uh, slide. This is the very last page in the manuscript. So all the other pages take this same format, and it's only at the very end, in the very bottom right corner, uh, that there's a brief portion in Burmese here in red lacquer, and that's the a very short colophon giving the name of the person who decorated or inscribed uh, the manuscript. And this, uh, this text uh, this uh, this particular uh, format in this these dimensions is also done in other materialities within the Burmese manuscript tradition. So sometimes on ivory, on various forms of metal, on paper, and again these this particular text is reproduced on palm leaf as well. But this particular example uh, has this uh, wonderful combination of cloth. Because this is likely a royal manuscript, the cloth itself would have been uh, that no longer used within the royal palace, but still retaining this high status as cloth and so used for this uh, kind of religious manuscript that might be donated by the parents of a young man becoming a monk for his ordination ceremony. If we could move to the next slide. Please, uh, here is just an example of the, the way in which a similar format of manuscript has been used in this region for a very long time. So the example from the Royal Ontario Museum, that's here in this exhibition, it dates from the mid 19th century as most Gamawaja manuscripts of this type that survive today. But we see a very similar format in uh, one of the earliest uh, surviving uh, physical pieces of evidence for writing in Pali. This is in, uh, in the, the Pali language, an extract from the, the Buddhist scriptures or the Tipitaka, here written in a script that we might refer to as Pew script or Southeast Asian Brahmi script, the particular variant of Brahmi script used throughout mainland Southeast Asia in the early centuries of the common era. And again, this emphasis on the beauty of the object that uh, contains the words of the Buddha is very much, very much present. The same Bhoti format is being used. And the script used here, well, it looks quite different than this tamarind script seed variant of Burmese script. It actually uh, traces, it, that script can trace a very direct line back to this uh, example from the fifth century. If we can go on to the next uh, slide. Here in closing, I just wanted to show you a, an example from elsewhere in Southeast Asia of how this particular text this Upasampada Kamavaja, the acts, uh, the ritual acts, the words recited for the ordination ceremony, this particular script might be recorded in uh, manuscripts from Northern Thailand. These are three examples held in the Bancroft Library at the University of California, Berkeley. One example at the bottom showing a cover of such a manuscript, and then two examples of the first uh, leaves of these manuscripts. On the top example, we see the, the exact same text here in the Tam script used in Lanna or Northern Thai uh, Buddhist culture to uh, record this same text, but in a much less elaborate format. This is the Talapot Palm, again, that's been inscribed 
washed over with ink and then once rubbed clean, the ink remains in the portions that are inscribed. Then in the middle portion, uh, we see an example of a colophon leaf. Colophon leaves like this can appear at the beginning or at the end of this particular type of manuscript in the Southeast Asian context. And this particular colophon, when translated from the Lana language of Northern Thailand, reads this Gamawaja fascicle had as its primary sponsor the Ubasaka or layperson named uh, Tao Wong. Uh, together with his wife and all of their children who sponsored this man manuscript to be of support to the dispensation, the religion of the Buddha. Uh, and may it be for all of us something that supports uh, the three forms of happiness that, uh, that one can enjoy in the human realm, in the realm of the gods, and that of Nirvana. And this kind of colophon that we don't see it in all of the manuscripts represented, and we don't see this detailed colophon in the Burmese example that's at the, the focus uh, object that we've been discussing here, this really expresses the sentiment in the construction of these manuscripts. Here, sponsored by a family, perhaps for an ordination a ceremony, uh, not only to make merit for the family in question, but to extend the lifetime of the dharma itself. So that's all I have for today. Thank you very much for your patience with me. Thank you so much, Trent, and thank you so much to all the other presenters. Um, I know that I am full of questions to ask um, and uh, and things to discuss. Um, I And since uh, we have about half an hour here now for discussion, questions, um, I was hoping that perhaps I could ask or, or perhaps bring up some points that I thought maybe um, could tie some things together a little bit um, that maybe we could reflect on for just a few minutes and then we'll get to the questions or ask the chat. And please uh, feel free to keep um, putting um, questions in the chat now. Um, I guess I kind of am interested in seeing all of these talks through the lens that was provided by perhaps Sarah's paper, in which she was discussing um, this visiting the space as, as if like, as if, uh, you know, visiting as this kind of space as a book or something like this. So seeing the resonances between the space and the book. So I actually kind of it dawned on me that perhaps I, I think we, we've been conditioned as academics with our little libraries and our books that we have behind us uh, to think about books as things that we have and that we refer to, not as things to be visited, um, not as things that aren't always available, not as things that aren't require special preparation or uh, 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 something like this. Uh, so that when we think of a, a monastic library, even a monastic library in the Middle Ages, we think of them as libraries, things that will be consulted in different um, in different sorts of ways. And I can't help but think of now, what if we thought of books, especially books like the ones we're looking at here, especially like manuscripts like the ones we're looking at here, as uh, things to be visited. Um, so, um, and as, uh, uh, so I just wanted to just, put out a few general questions about um, uh, how I think this might get discussion out of it. And this, the first bit is mainly directed towards uh, Jinna and, um, and uh, Alexander, uh, but also Trent in, in a certain way. Um, who are these paint, so who are these paintings for in these, um, in these manuscripts? And I guess this goes to Sarah's question too. Who are these, who would, who would the, actual uh, uh, illuminated bits of this uh, Pancharaksha manuscript before? Would they be for the reader or would they be for the person watching? And I can't, I was looking at the text layout because it's like the text and the pictures go in the same way. But when you read, you know, you kind of, would you lay out these manuscripts so that other people could see the um, the images when they would be read? Would this would this layout that actually be part of this performance um, that would be made for something someone that has an audience? And actually, this this um, this uh, uh, Kamavacha uh, Kamavasa manuscript also leads to that. Who are, who is this illumination for? Is it just to show itself as a prestige object, 
or is it actually part of the, the, the performative unveiling of this between covers? And actually, that's one other thing that we didn't really talk about. These book covers that I know of, especially from Nepal, tend to be incredibly um, ornate in how they're, in how they're laid up. So, um, so that was just one general sort of thing that I wanted to put out there for, that perhaps we could reflect on. Um, actually, I'll leave it there for now, and then we can go to some of the other questions and open it up for the other uh, uh, um, uh, people here. Sorry. Uh, did you want us to respond to that question first? Or? Yeah, I actually, actually, yeah, maybe, if, maybe you could start, Jenna. Like, who are, who do you think these 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 paintings are actually, or these illuminations are actually made for? How would they uh, take part in the the ritual life of the, the object? Uh, Melissa, if we can go back to the image, like to the back side where, yes, yeah, something like that. But, uh, so, you know, this is like a late 17th century Nepalese manuscript. And I mean, even not here, I guess, even in earlier instances that you wouldn't actually switch the order of the painting so that, you know, reciter and the, the devotees that are surrounded would actually view it differently. It's actually just the presence itself is that matters. It's not necessarily for even just the, the visual is part of that, that material presence of the divine. So in a way, or the teaching. So it's not, it's, it's for everyone. It's for, and it's, that's how the manuscript actually does become this important cultic object. And this is a wonderful example where the, the scribe and the manuscript makers in Nepal really kind of intro introduces the idea of the visuality of the text and the image itself is very important. So the first, you know, it's like a big bold face. The first page of that text of the each goddess text actually gets this big font, right? A really enlarged font with a heading. Like, and the, the images are like a heading of the text beginning. And that's the, again, the sound, the text, the, the written letters, and the image all are, we need to sort of think, it, think of it as not separate. It's really, you know, text is for reader and the images for viewer. It's, it's not, I, I think that's a more uh, logocentric way of thinking about uh, text and image. It's, I think in this sort of cultural and sort of religious context, this is one and the same in a way that, so who's reading it? It's you know, reading the text itself doesn't, is it's not necessarily for discursive teaching, especially in the case of Pantaraksha. Mm -hmm. It's really like knowing it by heart. And I mean, it's really part of the practice, the ritual that actually generates a meaning, not necessarily each word means something. Like artam is not necessarily in the way that you really discursively know one, one, one. It's really that whole wholeness of it. And and especially in the case of Panjaraksha text, that's the case. And you see that the last folio actually has a donor, the whole patron family gathered around with the Buddha himself kind of holding the text, right, mm -hmm. in, in the middle. And so you, you have, to, this is all kind of lined up and as if they're in the, in one plane that you need to imagine them kind of circling around this one priest or the Buddha in this case. So, you know, the text might be held in, the Buddha's hand, but the sound and the performance is to be experienced by everyone. It's really the enhancer of that performance and kind of presence making. And the Buddha himself is holding that nice Poti, that, man, that, Poti style yes. manuscript there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry, did. So I, I see that we have many, and by the way, you know, please uh, interrupt me with other. Um, points that we'd like to make, but I see we have many um, questions and, and uh, comments that I'd like to get to. Um, a, a lot of questions came up around uh, Sarah's um, presentation about the monastery at Shalu. And um, if I can kind of, um, uh, one larger methodological question was how do you, it was around the term, you use the term cinematic. Um, and mm -hmm. I think what we can maybe get out of that is like, what, what do you think about the visuality of this? What do you, or both visuality and narrative nature of this? How do these uh, sorts of ideas uh, come together? Do you think that there would have been guides for illiterate 
viewers that would point out or even read the text. But then that comes to another question that uh, someone asked, which was, but could people actually read the text that was up so high? Would So, I mean, that made me think, oh, would somebody walk around with the actual text of the Jathakas? They could read it, or would this be more of like a memory sort of aid where the text is on the wall, but you would just kind of narrate uh, the, the the action in the pictures? Um, and then uh, another question about the layout. Uh, it seems like there's these kind of bands around the text, uh, around the paintings that look like what we saw in the Poti style manuscripts. So I was wondering if you just had any general comments yeah. on these. Um, uh, Thank you. I know those are all really great questions and in some way they're related, but also I'll try to do my best to get to all of them quickly. So first of all, thank you so much for the, for um, uh, I think it's Melissa pointed out the like what's so what's the relationship to poti style manuscript because i definitely glossed over that and missed making a point of it even though it's kind of the main point so what's so fascinating to like when we start in this overall workshop with jinnah's presentation of like poti style looks the way it does because it comes from palm leaves and yet even with the advent of paper and the widespread use of paper production they keep the format the same. There's no need, right? You're not using palm leaves anymore. They don't have to be wide horizontals, but there's something about the material shape that is significant enough to these to keep. And that translates into Tibetan manuscripts, into Tibetan sacred texts, which are not on palm leaves, they're on paper, but the paper is kept in that format, that wide horizontal format, that two-sided thing. Um, and that, and, and, it, and it doesn't have to be, because really, if you think about it, they've translated everything else. They've literally translated the text to a different language, which requires a bunch of fudging and weirdness sometimes, right? And, and in, the invention of terms. So there's no real need to keep the material format the same, or like even the, the present, like there's even, even uh, like there's all these paper books that, um, preserve like the look of holes, like decorations around the, the space where holes would have been even when there's no holes <laughs> for binding the pages, right? So there's all these ways that the materiality of is translated. And then, yes, yeah, so the point here too is onto the wall space, like into the murals, there would be other ways to add inscriptions to the stories that don't look like pages, but they've made the choice, the conscious design choice here to make all the stories look like one page each one one horizontally aligned you know much wider than it is tall uh inscription uh, along the bottom and and just so it's clear too there's 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 a hundred stories they're also being organized in sets of 10. so if you go to the slide that's like one story um you can kind of see that that's the last um like go to the one that's like the story of Sonam Tope or whatever, the Jataka single story, you can see, yeah, you can see that. So the inscription is below each story and the painting is above each story. And then what you're seeing there is the band that uh, there's a decorative band at the right there of like just a scrolling pattern with some elephants and stuff in it, flowers, whatever. Um, and that's the division of the sets of 10, like the 10 stories are divided by 10 and uh, like 10 by 10 to make up 100. <laughs> And this is a whole thing that's explained in the colophon by the author, um, the, the 14th century author, the, the Tibetan author, Ranjung Dorje, the Karmapa. So anyway, uh, the cinematic thing, maybe I was a little flippant with the use of cinematic or cinemascope because I realized that I think the person asking knows more about cinema than I do. <laughs> and certainly this is in the 14th century where no one's really going to the cinema. <laughs> However, I guess I was using it because like, what's interesting to me in this passageway is it's definitely made for movement like pilgrims like the idea of a passage of a circumambulatory passage is that your body moves past it that's what you do you're not invite like you're not expected or even invited really to like slow down stop and read because that's just not the function of what a circumambulatory passage is right it's made to walk past so i don't really think people are invited or expected to stop and read these i think they're visible but not but like the impression is one of like a lot of detail but not um like not stop and read it um now the question of whether there were guides literate guides at the temple is a really good and interesting one there's certainly examples across asia of like you know 
sung storytellers or like storytelling with pictures that happens in and it's certainly not impossible there's other parts of this temple where i really do think that uh like the placement of inscription to to wall painting invited a certain kind of like it would have made sense for a monk to welcome a pilgrim into that space and say hey it says this right this is what it says i don't think though that applies as much here <laughs> i just don't because of the because of what i was just saying about the circumambulatory passage the nature of that now jataka stories were pretty popular like people knew them so you might know you know you might kind of know right this the store oh, that's that's there it is the mahasattva jataka the one with the tigress that's the one right you'd see a tiger and you'd know um also they're kind of easy like if you were even low level literate which i think we must also entertain the idea that like there must be levels of literacy of like how quickly people could read or whatever but they're they follow such a formula that they start and end with the same set phrases so you can very quickly see like every single inscription ends with this was story 90 the story of Sonamtop. this was story, you know so like you would you can kind of get that even as you walk past if you're baseline literate and then the question was also about um like, are they for literate viewers? So yes, and like, I think it's a yes and they're for literate viewers and or illiterate viewers and literate viewers. They're for both, right? And they maybe serve those communities, which are probably more than two anyways, but serve those communities differently, right? Um, but equally, and I think, um, yeah, does that make sense? Like, but yeah, it's so exactly, Jill, thank you. It's almost like VR with the people like you're the people pilgrims are supplying the the movement right so the picture the, you move your body past the pictures and they they flutter past you right um two at a time but but uh yeah when i when i looked up cinemascope i did find it interesting that it means it results in an image that's almost two and a half times as wide as it is high because that's true of these <laughs> but so maybe the cinema scholars in the room can tell me something about whether i'm misusing the term there but um yeah, thank you. And um, Suzanne had a, a question or to think about perhaps larger linkages between these um, between these uh, uh, the the poti leaf pages that we sh uh, showed towards the end, um, the the ones that are printed on dark paper. Um, if we can maybe go back to those. Um, is this practice comp uh, comparable to what we see in Islamic uh, and Byzantine? So like Islamic, like the famous blue Quran. Um, and the Byzantine gospel or ancient uh, Roman luxury manuscripts, or is this a completely different um, tradition? And I think we're talking about is this dark paper with this kind of uh, um, golden writing, golden or silver writing that you see in um, uh, Tibet right. and, and other places. Right. So there are, so in terms of history of making these, there are, at least in terms of surviving material from Nepal, you have black paper manuscript written in uh, silver or gold ink from at least the 11th century. And, uh, and the method of making is different in different communities. So Tibetan ones that they, and I think it's sort of a question to explore further whether there's a common, common ground in terms of sort of method of making. And, but the idea of having just blue black paper or dyed paper with golden lettering actually kind of goes well with the scriptural passages, at least in the Buddhist context of the Pragyaparamita. Actually, there is a reference to the golden tablet with the Vajriya or written with lapis lazuli or lapis lazuli. So that can also capture the idea of, you know, the blue black paper with the golden lettering. So um, that's how the, the, the scripture that's actually to be worshiped is supposed to have been uh, made. That's what Pragyaparamita Sutra actually explains in one scene that this is enshrined in a tower and that's what it's written with. So Vaidriya is the often translated lapis lazuli and golden. Uh, so golden tablet and lapis lazuli are used in the description of manuscript. And so that's one clue, but uh, in terms of the, the sort of, I'm, I'm always sort of fascinated by the comparison actually because they're that you know blue black paper Quran and also uh, seen as uh, the question about Byzantine uh, manuscript or even sort of Roman, ancient Roman luxury manuscript I don't know if it's just commonalities about this golden letters and how to make the golden letters uh, come about really shine uh, 
or is there is a methodology that's shared? Because I, I think in at least one case, there is dyeing of indigo, like using of indigo to dye the paper. But there are other practices in sort of Himalayan uh, region that actually uses a different types of material, like wheat beer, round cardamom, and burnt and round wild cowries, cowries shell sprinkling with mylovolin juice. So it's a chemical reaction that turns it into that color. Whereas, I mean, sometimes it's deep dipped or it's actually many pages pasted together. There's a different method of making this where an indigo, I think a vellum dyed in indigo is what that, um, isn't it? The blue crown might be the, isn't that the indigo dyed vellum? I think it's what that is. So whether that technology is shared, it's, I think that needs more research and more historical kind of evidence to see how much is shared across this Silk Road, actually. That's uh, what would be interesting to probe, but we do have evidence of making, of, or at least surviving evidence of these manuscripts from Nepal from the 11th century, late 11th, early 12th century, so, yeah. I think it's definitely a possibility too that it's like the shared, like the desire for something that looks the same is there, but then also different areas have to come up with their different way yeah. of making that. And also I was just gonna mention an, an interesting tidbit is, I mean, often Tibetan manuscripts would like, cause it was expensive, more expensive, more difficult to have pages with gold lettering on them. So sometimes you'd have just the top page and the bottom page, like just the colophon and just the, the first page as the blue pages, right? And that's what happens actually. So Shalu's inscriptions do, do that. There's the first one is on is on a dark blue background in gold lettering on the wall to look like the 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 first the special first page. Um, yeah, so. You no, know, that special first page thing is uh, taken up very seriously in Tibetan monastic communities. It seems that you know they start really block lettering big, and it's almost like a frontispiece, which is a mm -hmm. practice from Chinese side that mm -hmm. will actually come in. Uh, you know. mm -hmm. Yeah, the frontispiece. I didn't actually illustrate yeah. it. Sorry, you guys are looking for a slide that doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Cool. And I just had a general curiosity about the history of this, uh, especially, in, I can't get over like, you know, these illuminated uh, Pothi manuscripts. Do, you, do we see this in non-Buddhist manuscripts early on, or do you think this is a practice that comes from Buddhist texts and then go, I know some from Jain uh, texts, or do you think there is all happening, Jain, Hindu, Buddhist at the same time, or well, just more Buddhist examples because of what is preserved in Nepal? Or is it, uh, or or do you see this as particularly coming out of specific Buddhist practices? I, I think there is a Buddhist practice bent in a way that it actually comes, it's because of Buddhism actually being connected so well outside uh, South Asian continent that, and book being so mobile that, you know, you can't just think of the directionality of influence one way, like it's out of South Asia elsewhere when Buddhism comes out of, but there are a lot of people coming back in or, <laughs> or traveling to South Asia. So that the directionality should be really not assumed. It's just one way, one way direction. And it's going to, the, the sphere of influences are, are very, it's not just very unidirectional or just, uh, just one line, it's mm -hmm. many. And uh, with that, I think that said, and then also if you look at surviving evidence, I mean, that can, that as you mentioned might be skewed by what survives better in Nepal, but there are Hindu or like Brahmanic tantras that actually do have um, painted covers, but mm -hmm. putting the images inside the mm -hmm. book yeah. is not practiced so much until a little later. So mm -hmm. it's, I think Buddhist really does embrace this early uh, and that might actually come from actually what is happening in, in you know, what is exemplified in, Central Asian sites and, and into China. So uh, that's my sense of how this actually kind of begins. And I see we only have a few minutes remaining. I just didn't know if uh, Suzanne or um, one of the organizers wanted to come in uh, for any sort of last I wonder, points. I wonder, oops, I wonder if I could ask a kind of broad yeah. question um, that might be a, a nice 
point to sort of become coming close to the end of the day with. I was so struck um, in Jenna's description, it, she gave us some opening uh, maps, of course, I love maps, um, of, of showing the Indic manuscript culture zone and um, even the Poti manuscript zone. And I was really struck by thinking about that as a, another way of understanding regional connectivity and thinking about how do we um, group and manage our areas of study. And I guess what I wanted to do as a sort of a provocation is to ask each of you, and we've been talking quite a bit about a wide range of varieties of Buddhist ritual practice, the role of books, uh, whether on walls or as objects or even as embodied participants in some sense. Um, what, how can I put it? Should we think about this as a single zone? Should we think about this as a, um, uh, as a kind of well-defined region of connectivity? Um, and if so, what are competing ones that are also there? In other words, what are some of the variables? What are some of the pressures that pull in different directions as we conceptualize this region of the world? I don't know if that's a useful provocation or not a very useful one. That's fascinating. And I think already in Jenna's presentation, we see the ways in which there are within this region different competing formats of even the Poti manuscript, different materialities at play. And certainly as we approach the edges of this world, there are also other kinds of formats, such as the concertina or the leporello on various forms of bark paper, which is quite prominent, you know, interestingly in the, say, the Thiasafu format in the Newar context in Nepal, but also in all the different forms of paper uh, leporellos that become quite important in Southeast Asian manuscript culture. Some people might speculate that that could be connected to uh, longer um, practices of paper production and similar kinds of manuscript formats in East Asia. Uh, but I don't know about the particular histories of that format and the way they competed. But I think certainly thinking about what's happening at the edges of this zone is really important for defining what's going on within it. And if I can kind of add to that, I think this one thing that's really interesting is, you know, we just looked at two mainly two areas and the, the connections that, that come up to it but there's other really fast uh, you know like every area in India has its own traditions that are also in conversation with these I'm thinking particularly of places like Orissa or something like this on the eastern uh on the eastern edge of the Indian subcontinent and then I should I also want to say because I have to push this <laughs> is that then there's also different ways of making books and writing within uh, South Asia, and I'm thinking particularly of Kashmir, birch bark, and then also the, the bark paper that um, that Trent mentioned that tends to be up in the Northeast uh, uh, and Eastern part of India. Um, but what's really interesting when it comes to birch bark paper, this, this kind of illumination doesn't really happen there. Uh, it has its own sort of layout. However, in Nepal, or sorry, in Tibet, you see both Sanskrit texts that come in in the birch bark and in the Pothi format. And sometimes you even see birch bark cut to be like in the Pothi format, but this happens in Tibet, not in Kashmir where the birch bark is from. So you, uh, by the way, Kazuo Kano's work on this is really, really interesting. Um, and you can begin to see that this is all that these ideas are in motion constantly and new ways of presenting these, like the Leporello formats, um, which you, are something that use birch, or sorry, they use palm leaves and then kind of connect them together so that they fold out, become, which becomes a new sort of birch uh, palm leaf manuscript that's different from this loose style that we we're talking about now with the leaves that you can take apart. So yeah, it's really interesting to see how dynamic that this might be. We can talk about this as a world, but a world without, I don't think we can think about a definitive center to it. it these, these ideas are always being updated and, um, and coming into new sorts of congeries, if we can speak about it that way. So. Luther, I want to make uh, some comments if, if I'm allowed to, uh, you know, I enjoyed all presentations and they were very uh, inspirational and uh, I just want to mention when we were discussing the Blue Quran, of course, the technique uh, in production of these manuscripts might uh, variate, but the needs of human being for this uh, color code or the symbolic meaning 
might be uh, common shared uh, among the di among different cultures and on the other hand alex uh, alexander i was fascinated when you were talking about the traditions of recitation of divine books uh, and it um, it reminded me on uh, islamic praxis uh, when quran is recited uh, in um, how uh, in private houses uh, every Muslim woman put uh, a cup of salt, a cup of sugar, and sometimes also a cup of rice. And uh, they are later on mixed with a huge amount of uh, this uh, of, of re re food of reserve. And this is, so to speak, how you can carry the blessing, divine blessing through the materiality into your body. And uh, Suzanne and I, we were fascinated when we were creating our concept for the exhibition, this relationship between human human body and book or book and the body and um, for uh, Sarah's uh, presentation I was fascinated and the question of course uh, Ill for illiterate people or for whom these uh, the, uh, the uh, um, uh, descriptions uh, depictions are um, but on the other hand we know also the tradition of memorizing so you don't need to specifically be able to read you remember it, you memorize it. And that's also the very strong tradition of the Islamic uh, culture, actually. Uh, and uh, if I may say, you know, the term Hafiz in Islamic culture is a person who memorized the entire Quran. So, uh, and then of course, the readability or being literate is uh, second, um, secondary. And uh, these kind of connections and uh, in collective recitations is also we see along the Silk Road throughout the manuscript productions. And uh, I am so amazed to see these uh, connections. On, on the other hand, uh, um, I am not going to glorify, of course, but uh, through the Mongols, there are so many traditions are shared and interlinked. And uh, I, when I saw the uh, uh, oral paintings, I was thinking, this is the same color called <coughs> Shahname, Mongol Shahname. Why I'm looking at this or why it is familiar for me although the tradition doesn't speak to me in that regard. But uh, uh, we shall not forget uh, some of the Turco-Mongol uh, rulers were Buddhist and they were following the Tibetan pathway. And uh, that was also one of the reasons why we included our beautiful silk on silk rope uh, from a uh, Mongol tradition. And some of them are uh, entered into the market uh, through the looting of uh, Tibetan uh, temples where they were sent by Mongol rulers as uh, diplomatic gifts or as a donation to, to the uh, temples. And all of these, when we put together and in this um, manuscript tradition and how, how we communicate and uh, shift and how we translate our human needs and intercultural, uh, with the intercultural exchange, it makes totally sense, at least to me. <laughs> I just want to say it. Thank you. Can I respond briefly? Oh. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, thanks so much for mentioning that because I, I feel the same. I mean, there's a lot of confluence going on with like, yeah, Persian manuscript paintings and Shalu's paintings because there's things that have never, like they honestly have never happened in Tibetan art until that moment that we have, at, at least from what we have um, that survives, which of course is partial. But there's there's hats and groupings that just look too much like borrowed from those manuscripts, which is fascinating. Um, but, but I also think that there's, there's, um, there's so much to, to think, yeah, I, I agree with you that we shouldn't glorify, but we also shouldn't vilify, right? Like the Mongols were, so it's, this is a moment of this like huge cultural shift that enables all this contact that then leads to all this stuff, right? So they're not, there's they're also not the villains of european history that we've come to they're not exclusively that right there's a lot of, of other stuff that happens and yet we also have to hold that in balance with like we're also we're here on a panel about silk roads at a moment where current prc is talking about a new silk road and we're watching the decimation of ukraine by the russians and those two things will go hand in hand right like they're and we are watching it so i also feel like there's an ethical responsibility for us historians to keep looking for the uh, more complicated and more nuanced stories than the ones we've been told. That's a wonderful point to end on. <laughs>
Well, I suppose I will close us off here. Thank you so much. Thank you to the audience and thank you so much for the presenters. And of course, thank you uh, to the organizers for putting this together. I've learned so much and I look forward to continuing conversations. So thank you very much. Thank you, for the thank, you. Thank, you. Yeah. thank you for moderating. And I want to again, thank the co-sponsors of the symposium, the HN Ho Center for Buddhist Studies and the Institute um, of its Islamic Studies at the University of Toronto, as well as the BSR and the Aga Khan Museum. And thank you for to all of the presenters. This was absolutely amazing and really compelling, uh, just bringing all the themes together. It's really given me so much to think about and us as a group in general. And thank you to Alexander O'Neill for getting up at 3 a.m. in Japan to join us. So. Was saying like we should, should prop him up over there and now you can go back to sleep or i guess start your day so <laughs> thank you heroic efforts all around and tomorrow we'll see you at 10 a.m we'll have a ethiopia session a wonderful performance at midday break and then a session on the americas and wrapping up with uh, alexander gillespie thank you thank you <laughs>